right, so we have a uh, big topic to talk about today. A bit about me, um, those who don't know me. Uh, I've been in the community for quite a while. Um, I've um, been involved in quite a lot of data vault projects now, going back um, quite some time, uh, a good eight, good eight years or so. And um, data vault's a really interesting topic, interesting to, to learn about how data vault actually works, how it's used in various organizations. Um, the reason I'm interested in it is I love problem solving. I love, I love systems, um, which comes out of my history of being a, a sort of physics graduate uh, from London University, which is a very long, long time ago. Um, I've been involved in consultancy all my career. Uh, started off with IT consultancy, dabbled a bit with management consultancy, and then now with BI sort of sitting in the middle between management and IT. So very interesting applications of IT and how management use uh, intelligence and data to, to build their businesses and move them forward. Um, obviously, I'm the chairman of the UK Data Vault user group, so I introduce most of these sessions uh, once a month um, and specialist in Data Vault 2 data platforms. That's all I'm going to say about me. I've uh, been around for a while and happy to answer questions if anyone has any later on. Um, so the today's topic, um, data mesh and data vault. So really what we're trying to do is to is to compare data vault for data mesh. And is one better than the other? Is 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 it true the other way around? Are they comparable? Um, are they trying to address the same problem space? Um, I don't, well, I'll, I'll provide you some answers there, but these are very important questions to ask if you're going to to compare them. So in other words, do I have to choose data vault or data mesh? Or could I have data vault and data mesh? And, and if I do have and in there, uh, what, what do I have to do in data vault and data mesh to make them work together properly? Now, um, data mesh talks about um, uh, two planes in here. So they have an operations plane, which is the systems that are running your business. Um, and they talk about the analytics plane, which is where your BI systems and reporting systems sit. And there's a two-way flow of data between them. So your operations plane is feeding data up um, into your analytics plane. Uh, data has been analyzed up there, and then maybe the results push down onto the operations plane to drive decision-making or uh, to support um, enhanced data flows. Um, your analytics plane, is involved with all this stuff around reporting, uh, decision-making, analytics, data science, forecasting, all the nice things that are going on in our space at the moment. But it's important to separate these two things out. You now, the operations plane in there, the systems you're building are very much oriented around your business processes. They're trying to drive your business as efficiently as possible at, at low risk. The analytics plane is about uh, studying and understanding and gaining insights and often around uh, large data set processing and so forth. So very important to, to separate the two out in there. Um, okay, I'll, what I'll try and do, if you want to ask questions as we go, pop them in the chat. Um, and um, uh, if, uh, if I've got anyone, Mark, are you online with us? No, he isn't. Right, maybe, maybe Will, you can step in. If you can see the chat, let me know if there's any questions I need to ask as we go. Do you mind that doing that for me, Will? Will Riley, can you? Thank you. All right. Um, right. So let's let's move on. Anyway, so there's two flow two way flow of data in here: operations and analytics. And um, actually, I think um, obviously in the analytics plane, that's the area where both data mesh and data vault play. So they're both trying to solve those sort of issues uh, issues up in that plane, and if you look at it at first, sort of first glance at it, you know what is uh, data mesh talks about federation, about splitting your data out amongst domains and so on. Data Vault has a very centralist message about building one uh, integrated view of your data, um, and if you look at them in that in that level, you would think well, they're diametrically opposite from each other. Uh, one centralizing, one's decentralizing, one's allowing different teams to work at their own pace, one's setting standards over, over your data and integrating it. Um, but as you look deeper into these, you find that actually 
neither is really at those extremes. So data mesh can be at the extreme of federation. Data fault can be the extreme of centralization. But if you abandon those thoughts and move towards the center there, there's a great deal of overlap between them. Um, so what is data vault? This is Dan Linster's definition of it. Um, not sure I like it much, but never mind. This is the definition of what it is. And uh, there are two points in here that I always um, sort of push out in, in, in the marketplace whenever I talk about data vault. And I've highlighted those in there. So the first of which is that data vault's a system. So data vault's not a method. So it doesn't have tasks and deliverables in it. It's more of a information about the way of building your warehouse. It's more of an architecture, guidance on the SQL you might use to uh, build out that architecture and information about ways of working. So if you're opening that up expecting to see step one, step two, step three tasks and so on set out, that isn't what you get out of it. It's 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 more information about the, the, the thing you're building. Um, it also talks about enterprise vision and that's about integration. So bringing data in from multiple sources um, and those sources covering a portion of, or maybe you're the whole enterprise. All right, so it, it gives you a way of building out the intelligence platform it focuses on the on the what you need to do what you need to build in there data mesh well this is an interesting one uh, before i came on this presentation i thought i'd have a dig around and see what people say about data mesh uh, this is aws's definition of a of a, of a data mesh and, and it's got some interesting things in here uh, it talks about it being an architectural framework um, I'm not sure I agree. It solves advanced data security challenges. I'm not sure that's its main thread, thread in here, but it does do distributed and decentralized stuff. It does integration. That's interesting. So it wants to decentralize, but also integration. Um, apparently, it effectively unites the dis disparate data sources and links them together through centrally managed data sharing. So here we've got centralization mentioned in here. Um, and data mesh adds complexities to architecture, but brings efficiency. Um, that's interesting. So let's have a look at another one, shall we? Here's a company called Monte Carlo. Um, it takes them three paragraphs to provide an introduction to data mesh. And they talk about it being domain oriented, self-service, uh, talk about business domains, it's distributed domain specific data consumers, data as a product, and each domain handling their own data pipelines and so on. Um, it's got a universal interoperability, interoperability oh, can't pronounce that, interoperability layer uh, in there. And um, at the bottom, he talk, they talk about data meshy structures. Um, so some teams being more centralized maybe than the than the data mesh um, asks for. Uh, and here's IBM's definition. Um, let's see what they talk about. They talk about decentralization, business domains, governance on documentation, quality and access, self-service. Um, it means you can use data lakes and data warehouses, which is good. Uh, it promotes the adoption of cloud native and cloud platform technologies, I guess so. And it's commonly compared to microservices. Right, so that's three different companies. Um, I'd say it seems that none of them can explain data mesh in a short, simple way. Um, none of them have a common description of it or, or agreement necessarily on the overlap there. And it's absolutely clear, I think, when you read that, that data vault and data mesh are very different in scope in terms of what they're trying to achieve. More on this later. So. This to me is a is a is a is a worry because if you can't get sort of a clear view of what data mesh is out there, and these are amongst some you know leading organizations, how can we expect common data mesh architectures to evolve? Surely this means data mesh will mean different things to different people, and we're going to end up with a whole sprawl of different implementations out there. So I'm sure the, the inventors of data mesh at the moment are pulling their hair out about. How, how it's being interpreted and, and implemented across the market. That aside, um, data where, well, data mesh 
uh, starts talking about data warehousing and by implication data vault as well as being a centralized dinosaur. Okay, so they're, they're the view of uh, from data mesh's perspective is that we have all these sources coming in to a central data warehouse. It's managed by a single team. They act as a bottleneck and they're there as the, the source of all knowledge, uh, which they pump out on corporate and customer and, and whatever data that uh, the organization wants to see. Um, okay, that's a that's fine. That's a fairly simplistic view of what goes on. Um, but you could say, yes, data warehouses are potentially um, centralized bottlenecks. Um, and we're also operating in a uh, really interesting market at the moment where there's a real skills crisis. Um, particularly more so I, I find in, in the US, um, but in Europe too, where they're very difficult to find good data engineers out there or people who can do data modeling, for example. Um, there's, there's often varying degrees of data literacy within the business itself. Um, so managers, yeah, maybe liking spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets, but very little understanding of issues like data quality, uh, the data monetization aspects or how to do uh, more advanced analytics that would help them in, in managing their business better. Uh, woeful data quality across the piece in, in general, I think, out there, uh, to the point where uh, analytics is trying to fix the quality issues that are in the source systems and making a, a bad job of it, really. Um, the pace of change is picked up. The you just have to look at the rate at which um, large language models are moving um, to see from you know a standing start a few months ago to where they are now, the wave of change and the wave of innovations uh, picking up. And um, you need to be able to, to respond to those. Volumes of data are increasing. So you know the number of petabyte scale warehouses out there is, is growing rapidly. So you need big storage, big capabilities for processing in there. Uh, and new techniques, new understanding of, of uh, what it means to have data at scale. Um, regulation, tightening up. We've got some frightening looking AI uh, regulation coming out from the European Union soon, which is going to be a whole challenge to implement. Uh, and uh, the frequency of data feeds coming in, more frequent data feeds near, approaching near real time and availability of data for, for end users. And then how on earth do you get value out uh, of your data or even get value out of your data science? Um, have you uh, truly uh, truly doing what you need to do in the data science to, to maximize the value you get from the skills that you have? So this is general in the marketplace at the moment. And um, Data Mesh was sort of designed to uh, start to address some of these challenges. You know, for example, with skills crisis, it, it tries to um, de-skill as much as possible the production of your data platform by, by bringing it in as a service, for example. But Data Mesh isn't the only option for doing this. Um, so um, there are uh, other methods in the marketplace. Uh, data lakes, for example, try to simplify the capture and, uh, and serving of data. And data vault as well can be brought in to uh, accelerate and deliver things fast with a, with a smaller team. Right. Um, so data mesh also says that that okay, fine. So you've got the market conditions that we're in, and that your traditional BI systems are really too slow, uh, too slow to meet business needs. Um, and yes, I would agree with that. A, a, a number of real, really old legacy systems I see take months and months to make uh, to generate new data or make a change or add a table to their to their data set. Uh, and as a result of that, it, it's, it's centralized bottlenecked ivory tower. Um, to build a traditional BI system requires skill levels that are too high. As a result of that, it's all stifles innovation because everything's locked into a single team. Uh, you need all those deep specialisms to work with the data. Uh, and the uh, traditional uh, warehouse systems frequently fail. And also you have a generalist team of BI um, operators in the center who have a general understanding of the business, but not enough detail in the specialist areas of the business to give you the insights out that, that, that managers need. This is a pretty damning uh, view of, of what traditional BI is. But again, I'd say it's not entirely fair because Traditional BI teams are aware of this and 
they have been working on this for a while and loosening out, trying to be not to bottleneck as much as possible, introducing uh, dashboards and so on for self-service. So um, you, you, you could paint um, your traditional systems this way, but not, not, not entirely true. Right, so what Data Mesh is saying is let's decentralize the data. Let's not have a central team that manages the data. Let's have lots and lots of, of data sources for, for the data. Let's de-skill the work. In other words, let's try and provide things as a service as much as possible so that people can assemble the data they need with the, uh, the minimal skill set necessary. So we want data as a service, data platform as a service in there so people can fire things up and have them available without having to actually build them themselves. And, and then from that, you can give these teams freedom to do what they need to do within their own domains, with their own decentralized area. Uh, removing administrative barriers, so you can play with what you like inside your area, uh, but you will then need to strengthen governance around that just to avoid too much anarchy. So very much a federated approach to the architecture that you're going to build. Um, Yep, so the, the important thing in here is Data Mesh does suggest this, but it also suggests that we have governance and also suggests that we have some standards and so on. So you still need some centralization in there. You can't have completely decentralized free for all in there. The whole thing will just not, will not tie together in an integrated way. Um, drill down further into data mesh. The, the, the sort of op the opening pages of data mesh talk about there being uh, four principles. So uh, you have domain-oriented decentralized data ownership. I'll explain what that means in a moment. They want data as a product, so data to be considered as a as a product in the organisation. This I really like because um, software products have been around for a while and and they're understood. And actually the output from a data system as a data as a product brings in all kinds of good uh, connotations with it in terms of having um, versioning control and testing and teams dedicated to manage those products. Um, the counterbalances now come in, the federated com computational governance, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, but essentially that's about centralized setting of um, standards against which the, the domains will work. Uh, and where possible, self-service data infrastructure. So a domain can call up things pre-built for them to use instead of having to have all the skills to build things for themselves from scratch. Um, this is a diagram taken from um, the, the O'Reilly book uh, on data mesh. You can see these four uh, corners here in here. Now they're all counterbalancing each other. So if you have domain oriented ownership, Okay, you would um, that helps to present prevent some data signing in in your data as a product. Your data as a product, um, sorry, then also your domain oriented ownership empowers domain teams, which means you can then start to make use of your self serve data platform. If you have data as a product out there, um, that reduces the cost of ownership of the data. Um, and you can achieve that by making use of the, the self-serve data platform. Um, if you have domain-oriented ownership, it will increase engagement and reduce domain isolation if you can have governance looking across the whole domain space. And if you have data as a product, again, coming out of each domain, if you have governance around that, you can start to look, look at how these data items join together to add value. And then finally, the... Um, Federated Computational Governments um, will give you consistency and policy enforcement through the implementation of platforms. So this whole thing fits together in, in a sort of lock, lock way. You can't build data as a product without having the governance aspects, without having the self-serve platform and so on in place. All these things need to be there. Right, so what does that mean? Well, Data Mesh then talks about four things. Domain ownership, governance, data as a product, self-service platform. Data Vault talks about data integration, and I'm 
It talks about data marts, um, outputs, but really data products, if you want to look at it that way. So data vault really is a smaller scope uh, than data mesh. It's trying to address what you build, whereas data mesh is looking at the whole system, ecosystem that sits around your data uh, to drive a, a larger scale architecture in there. So this is possibly the first clue here as to what we can do for uh, getting the systems to work together is that if you come back here again, uh, data integration comes in the domain area and in the governance area. So in a sense, they can work together if data mesh allows data vault to take ownership of some of the design elements that it needs to work on. So let's drill down a bit. Okay, so here's the, the, four, the four corners, like I've said, um, and let's take a look at what a domain is. So we have a domain. Um, and domains typically are very close to what we call a business capability. So if you build a capability map of your organization, those are pretty good candidates for data domains. So if you're in insurance, you might have a policy or policy and claims area. I, when I work in insurance, I like to put those two together because they are so closely coupled in their data models. Um, but yes, you'd have a policy or claims area, maybe a management or, or customer, sorry, or customer management area, for example. So your domains are linked to things that your business is capable of doing. Um, so there'll be quite a few domains in your uh, business, and um, there could be a hierarchy of subdomains and sub subdomains in there as well. Um, and each of those is a candidate for um, a domain model or domain ownership of the data. Um, so let's drill down. Uh, the thing about a domain is it's a walled garden. So the team working in the domain has visibility of all the moving bits in there, but anyone outside the domain can only see the data products that that domain produces. So it's a kind of software driven view here of, of what's visible and invisible or within, the, within that domain. Okay, so your data products are the externally exposed uh, face of that domain and you know if we're working with large data sets which we often are in data warehousing um, I'd suggest that maybe exposing a table rather than an API or something would be a, a good way to to realize the data product um, have some some sort of table that's curated by that domain for, for people to access and uh, take data out or if you're going across company across organizations maybe even a data share in in Snowflake is a good way to get that data out. Um, and the, the thing about data mesh is then we have a whole network of these domains. Uh, all of those domains have um, things going on inside them, systems, source systems, and, uh, and processing going on, all exposing different uh, data products. And then data products may be input to other domains where they're needed to provide information that they need to assemble their own reporting needs. And you may notice here on also on the right, um, it, it is allowed in the architecture to have um, a data warehouse domain, which would take output from a lot of the other domains and do that sort of top level integration needed for the corporate reporting out there. So uh, you have you know, local needs in there and corporate needs all fitting into one. And this is quite an attractive way of working because you could say uh, we could have teams focusing on the areas of their own expertise and worry about the integration later um, once we get the, the warehouse working for the higher level reporting there. So what's a data product? Um, now, interesting thing is, you know, uh, you've probably seen this as well. Go into a, an organization with a traditional data warehouse and ask them how many reports they have running against it. And I'll typically get back answers anything from 5,000 to 20,000 reports running against it. And when you dive into the detail, you find that people have been uh, copying and pasting reports forward with different parameters in them. Majority of the reports have never been used or used only once um, and so on. So there's like a real complete mess of sprawl of reports that are there. Data products are something different. Data products are serious things they're invested in and they're managed as a product. 
So the idea is that that um, you want to scale right down and have just the fewest products that you need to be able to run and operate within your organization. So there's a definite consumer for the product and there's a business need to have that in place. It's not just an ad hoc query or something against the data set. So data products are made up of code, data in there, maybe metadata as well, um, and the infrastructure needed to run that, that data product. And all that's formalized and managed as a, as a software release. And it's designed to meet data contracts that are set out by the consumers of the data uh, and may well have automated compliance checking to verify that the, the data product meets these standards. So it's a fairly uh, tightly managed, um, invested in um, object in there. And this will reduce the number of products right down. So I did sit in a presentation a while ago from uh, ThoughtWorks where they were talking about a case study with a with a, a client. And I think the client had something like 60 reports that they must have. Um, and eventually they ended up with something like four data products in there, which satisfied the 60 reports that they had. So keeping the numbers right down to sort of small numbers is, is the way forward here. If you drill down inside a data product, apologies for the shift in notation here. I had a good search around for an example, but there's a lot of stuff going on inside a data product. Um, it needs documentation, it'll have storage, it'll have pipelines, policies in there, maybe some observability. It'll be taking data in from the outside. It might have a discovery port where you can use it to find that, that product uh, using metadata and output ports sending data out via various mechanisms. So it's quite a bit of move, moving parts inside a data product. Um, and um, it's, you know, it's a serious investment to, to build one of these things out. So if you need a data product, why not stick a data vault in there in the domain? After all, it does integration. So you can have a number of source systems from your operations plane uh, being queried in there, as well as other data feeds coming in. So you could do the integration in there. It also gives you point in time, so it builds up a history and an audit trail of what you're looking at. Um, and we can also cut multiple projects on that. All right, so it's, uh, it's, um, it's a potential solution. Um, but Data Mesh says the teams can choose. So inside the domains up to, up to the team. So they could use Excel, Microsoft Access, if you remember that, or Snowflake. They could use Kimball, Data Lakes, or Data Vault. It's entirely up to them, unless you set a central standard that says you must use this or you cannot use these certain things. So um, wondering, you know, how much uh, would a, a, a sort of domain team vote to use Data Vault as their, as their way forward? It really depends on the maturity of that team, um, whether they understood Data Vault or not as a team, and so forth. So I think it's difficult to get Data Vault into every domain out there, but possibly into some of those where you need that maturity and and uh, rigor that Data Vault brings to make the the, the products uh, work work efficiently. Um, so if you had a Data Vault based analytics domain, what would it look like? Well, I borrow something here from Patrick Cuba, um, but essentially. It's a data vault inside. So you have your source data flowing in from various various uh, domains. You build your raw vault. So you're integrating the data around the business concepts and units of work. Cutting any business rules in there to build out a business vault and then exposing the data at the far end as a data product. Um, this diagram looks more complicated than it actually is. You're effectively building a, a, a mini vault or a vault within the scope of the data that you have within that bounded context. Uh, and anything you're bringing in from the outside, fed from outside as a data product that you need to construct the, the data that you need for, for, for reporting. Um, but there's always a problem in here. If you've got different domains, what if they both want the same thing? So, you know, for example, say we have a sales domain and a support domain, and they both want customer, and they both want product in there. Surely we've got a contention in there. Do, do, what do we do? Do we allow them to run their own thing? Do we 
have another conceptual domain, which is the master of customer and product. H how does this work? You, you know, we've got a federated structure here. Surely if they're all equal to each other, we're going to have some issues. This is kind of where governance comes in, because as we design out the interfaces between various systems, uh, we've got various strategies we can use. So, for example, we could uh, say, well, if we can enforce uh, shared keys and go for business keys for concepts, then by definition, you'll get passive integration because the key in one system will be the same as the key in another, provided the standards are being followed. And therefore, you could take data from each system and merge it without any trouble. Um, you could let the things, the systems overlap, maybe give a, a, um, a data supplier, tell the data supplier to solve the issues on the way in. So just put a contract on it and say, we'll take supplier data from you, this domain over here, um, but we'll only take it as long as it meets certain criteria. Um, we could just take the data as it is from, a, from a, another domain and deal with any issues inside our domain. We could have contracts in place, service level agreements. We could we could set up a committee to collaborate, or we could just say we're not interested in integrating, and just you know let each system manage its own customer record sets and product sets, and abandon all attempts at integrating them until we until we have to. So there's different ways of approaching this, and um, you need to be relaxed enough to say well we're never going to integrate everything. Um, so if you don't in you know, care about what's going on inside each domain, then we've really got little control over how they're going to be set up and run, other than maybe providing this sort of platform as a service for them. So uh, if we can't do that, then the only thing we really have control over is these data products that are coming out of the, the systems themselves. Um, and um, what you then do is basically build a data product catalog uh, to uh, has a, to be act as a, um, a register of all these products that are in the system flowing around uh, and that, that users can then search and say, oh, I want information about that X and they can find where that is across the, across the flow here. Um, and that can then go up on something like a data marketplace. So Erwin has a, a data marketplace out there where you could push up and promote these, um, these particular data sets. Right, now, um, the thing about this then is if you are going to be pushing these data products around, they need to be a, a, a sort of accessible and, and, and pushed around in a fairly consistent way. And you don't want to be pushing files around as much as possible. So my sort of recommendation there would be to, to push each data product out as a sort of separate schema, um, maybe a database per domain. Uh, but create a separate schema for each data product that you're producing. And then uh, you grant permissions on uh, the tables in that schema to those who have uh, security rights to see such information. Now, um, another interesting thing is if you look inside these data products, um, you could see certain data elements start to repeat themselves. So for example, in customer service, yes, you've got a customer product, but HR also are pushing out uh, an HR data set, an org structure, and there's a corporate reporting data set as well there, but they may all mention the concept of the person. So surely we should have some standards for interoperability around the concept of person, even though person is a subset of these data sets that are being reported. You can see what I mean there. So um, here we have, for example, here we have data products, a customer, there's a data product for budgets, there's a data project product for HR, contain a whole series of components and, sorry, a whole series of components. And um, the um, the thing is they're, they're, they're like an assembly of components. So if you start to look inside these data products, so here's an example. If I have a customer data uh, set coming out, maybe it's got information about robots, persons, organizations, customer roles, supplier roles, and locators. All those are put together to make the customer data flow, data product that's coming out. Well, 
why don't we have a standard definition for each of these blocks um, that allows anyone that's reporting on person or robot or locator to export and send their data around in a consistent way. And then we can allow us to put, you know, uh, some constraints and business rules on top of that to uh, enforce the contracts that we've, we've signed. What does that mean? Well, we can have a separate standard for person, a separate standard for organization, separate standard for roles. And then the customer flow is just an assembly of these lower standards. But then the HR flow would be an assembly of some other standards, including some of these standards. So we can end up reusing person over and over again, wherever it appears in the different flows that are there. I'm going somewhere with this. So there we are. So to get those components specified, we need to have some kind of integrated data model which says this is what a person looks like, this is what a, uh, a product looks like, this is what a, a, a financial budget looks like, okay? Um, and then um, from there, we can cut the component standards and then assemble the flow specifications that we need to move around. And by having an integrated data model, we can be certain that those components will integrate no matter where they come from. In other words, the data model is about about the business key and, and some common attributes that we might want to use there. Right, so integration is all about business keys. This is this is very much a data vault method, um, data vault message. So, um, well, essentially that's what we're doing. We're, we're, we're in the integrated data model, we're getting the glossary of terms in place. We're doing our conceptual and data vault spine modeling. So we're identifying the hub and link structures in there and then using them to assemble the, the specification of the components that you're using. So um, here's a little aside. You think about interoperability and integration of data and so on. Um, data Mesh sort of talks about it as being a challenge for governance to get right. But there are examples out there in industry that have been running like this for, 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 for decades. Um, and um, when I worked in the Department for Education um, many years ago, we, we actually were working on such a system for, for defining standards. So what I thought I'd do is I'd dive a little bit into some of the details of how that worked to show you possibly how you could implement um, some of that centralised governance. So the, the concept is basically this. We have a, a business uh, situation where we have universities and higher education providers um, and they have a, a statistics agency called the Higher Education Statistics Authority. And their job, is, HESA's job, is to assemble statistics from the universities, uh, pass back um, benchmarks to the universities, but also to act on their behalf to report up to the Department for Education and uh, general statistics for the public on things like um, university scoring rates and the... Uh, the average earnings of students when they leave university six months into their career, that sort of thing. So um, lots of data flowing through the system here. So universities telling HESA about all kinds of stuff and all kinds of then reports being fed up to the Department for Education. So very complicated. Um, and um, we don't really have control what goes on inside each of those boxes. Uh, each university has its own IT systems and uh, HESA has its own systems, the Department of Education has its own statistics unit. So quite difficult to go in and tell these organizations what to do. But what we can concentrate on here is the message flows, the arrows that are here in the system. So data here is flowing all the time. Uh, we're getting data out on daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis uh, to, to satisfy all the business processes. Right, so yeah, data flowing all over the place. So um, HESA has a catalogue of all the reports it needs from the universities. And you can see here things on finance, you've got things on graduate outcomes. Yes, you've got information on, on providers and staff and data futures for students and so on. Lots and lots of data sets in here. So I could go into the HESA website and, uh, at the slash collection. I could click on any one of these and I could get an information about what the data flow contains. So let's pick on staff, okay? Um, 
this takes you to a page and here's a specification of that product. So there's an overview, there's a data specification there, there's processes for submission and quality assurance and guidance on the use of all these things. And in each section, there's lots of links out for descriptions of data items. There's a data model in here. There's XML specifications. There's information about what happens if you have a failed load, who to call if there's a problem. Yeah, all kinds of things you need around managing of a, of a data product in here. Um, so let's drill down a bit further. Let's click on the data specification. And here you can see we have uh, an indented list of things that you need to feed. So at the top, you can just about read maybe institution and inside that there's information about the record types and then there's information about person. And inside the person, there's information about contract. So it seems to me like here we have an institution has people, people have contracts sort of um, model going in there. And each of those attributes in there has further descriptions. So we have a field in there called lock leave, which is the um, location of a staff member's employment following the end of their employment at the reporting higher education provider. Uh, okay, it's applicable to England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, and so on. And the valid entries in there as well. So you put a code in there. So there's a, there's a constrained list that you have of valid values that we can feed. Okay, so that's quite a Quite a lot in there. This is just the specification, um, and um, yeah, if you look further down in the in the spec, it also has activity in there. So, institution has a person that has a contract that has an activity. They also have an institution that's a person who acts in the role of a governor. Um, so those are the two in there, also collected in as part of this data set. Now, um, that means we've got to model something like this, haven't we? which is there's a person, hub person and hub contract. Person's a party to the contract. Um, we could probably type this up. It might be uh, employment contract with, with institution. Um, the institution is inferred from the institution data at the top. But essentially, this is the kind of data vault model that we're looking at that would model this data set. OK. Um, and therefore, we could start to put standards around uh, around this and, and publish a model that would provide that integration uh, needed to bring all people or all contracts together into a single reporting entity for, for analytics purposes. Um, yep, so um, when you get the feed coming in, there's, uh, there's two data components in here. We could specify a standard for person and a standard for contract and having people as party to contract. So we could publish two standards for contract, one for contract, one for person. And those will be assembled then into this specification here on, on the left. Um, and then we could take one of those components and reuse it wherever person was mentioned in other, uh, in other assemblies. We would use that same standard over again and repeat. Right, so governance over this, if you can imagine down here, we've got our domains uh, and we've got various uh, standards in there. So here's a customer domain and maybe we've published three, um, three data standards in there, one covering a couple of hubs and a link, one covering a hub link hub and so on. Um, we can produce our data standards. So one standard for each of those dotted box areas and then we start to publish assemblies, which is the definition of the data product components. If you do it that way, then anything that flows through those data products will automatically integrate, passively integrate through the keys that we've chosen. Um, and the governance council sitting over that, making sure these standards are published, adhered to and followed in, the, in, the, in each domain as data crosses the boundary to the outside world. Right, um, so conclusion, um, I think data mesh and data vault can play well together uh, if you want them to. Uh, data vault will give you that semantic integration um, that uh, is very useful in terms of integration around business keys. Um, but the, there are many domain teams well may, well may lack the skills or interest to use data vault. However, maybe the key domain areas 
like data warehouse or um, uh, those with more mature data teams would be interested in using Data Vault internally as their domain. However, um, Data Vault can be used to help drive your standards um, but by, by providing an integration framework. Um, some other views I found quite interesting out there. Uh, Chad Sanderson, quite well-known blogger, he, he's written extensively on things like data is not a microservice. Um, so one, one way of looking at data mesh is to really think of it as encapsulating data as a microservice. And his view is that the nature of data is so fundamentally different from regular software development that applying microservices techniques there might be counterproductive. Um, well worth reading his blogs on that in case you want a, a contrary view. Um, and from our Data Vault conference, um, very in, insightful question from someone. I forget who it was, so I put a non there. But exactly what is the business need for data mesh? Um, so we hear a lot about data mesh uh, from a technical point of view, but is the business actually asking for a data mesh? Um, what, what does it need from it? What would it get given the sort of complexity you're adding in the coordination? In, as a result. Right, I've got lots of chat Are there. Any questions? So let me just call up the chat and see what I can see. Um, right, go to the top. So, right, so um, yeah. Oh. Um, other links given at the beginning of the session. Yes, we're going to publish the, this list. If I have missed a, a reference, a link, then please let me uh, let me know. Um, we have um, thanks, Will. Yes, yeah, so re removing administrative barriers. Uh, yes, so Data Mesh is trying to achieve that within each domain, basically giving each domain freedom to operate the way it wants to. I think, though, to counterbalance that, you need to have a very strong uh, central governance of this. Otherwise, you'll have um, a variety of standards in there and lose all the integration there. So I think we are, you're swapping one set of administrative barriers for another one. Um, and um, I, I think the jury's out as to whether you actually do remove administrative barriers in that here. Um, anyway, all right, so... Biggest thing about data mesh is that good principles usually mean a business is closer than it thinks to doing meshy things. I agree with that. Uh, in fact, you, um, I've, I've, I've sort of paraphrased some of Patrick Cuba's articles, but he writes a very good article about how you can have a centralized data vault, yet have it look like a decentralized set of data mesh domains um, by, by carefully um, encapsulating parts of the data model. Um, so he's got a really good article on Medium, Patrick, about how to do that. Um, I can't really comment too much on Fabric. Um, but it's, that does provide you with some of the layers for reporting on. Um, any further questions? Yes, yeah, so the, the de-skilling the data platform I think the, the view from data mesh is that if you're gonna have lots of domains out there, there's no way you can employ skilled data engineers and platform engineers inside every domain that you're going to need for your organization. So the only way you're gonna to manage to keep the, um, the standards of the technology up is by having a centralized tools team. So this tools team's job is to produce the reusable uh, as a service components for your data warehouse, uh, your data teams to use. Uh, and train and make those as easy to use as possible. So you get your standards through that way. So yes, you never can get rid of skilled people, but make use of them properly. Um, Jim, you asked a question about how does Data Mesh deal with enterprise-wide data governance and data rules? Um, I think um, what Data Mesh tries to do is tries to avoid getting into that, that space of the enterprise-wide governance and it fo focuses it down as much as it can. I think that's why it calls it computational governance. Um, so it's really looking at the standards and interoperability of the data flows, and also uh, the standards of adoption within each domain of, the, of what it needs to do to maintain consistency. 
in there. It's also suggested that the um, that that governance group is made up of the domain managers themselves as a group. So it's like a reverse ownership of the of the governance. It's a place for the different domains to talk and negotiate with each other. I think that's where it comes from. So it tries to avoid overlapping too much with the enterprise wide wide stuff. Um, mm hmm. Question here from Amit. I work with a giant retail uh, organization where we have centralized data vaults, but still we have different data products and domain owners that govern the data and ask, is it the responsibility of all data architects to liaise, to build a common vision? Um, I think in data mesh, uh, yes, they would like um, the data architects from each domain to get together to provide that governance across the piece. I don't think they can do that. I think there needs to be some um, organization around that, potentially a small architecture team at the very center, whose job it is to drive that federated structure um, and to get commitment and buy-in from the architects to use the standards that are there. Mike, yes, you said you, you like the assembly of customer as a data product, but it needs to include security and privacy standards too. Yes, I agree. Um, it, um, I illustrated these things in there, but if you if you open up and actually think in detail about what you need to define a data product, you'll end up with a lot more than I showed on the on the slide there. Um, they can get very complicated indeed. Uh, yeah, I don't think you can ever lose the need for a data modeler. Will um, you need a data modeler in every team? Um, I think to help um, understand the data, but you're not always going to get that, are you? They're, they're difficult to find. Um, all right, good. I think that's everything. Quite a few more questions. Yeah, the, we could argue about the definition of person in there, whether I'm right or not, but um, uh, person is, uh, is was an example in the in the logic here. I think that's all. Any further questions, anyone? Otherwise, I think we've we've more or less hit the time limit. I um, hope you enjoyed that. And um, we will um, cut this as a presentation for you um, to be, be up on the website um, um, shortly after Christmas or just before if we can get them moving. Great. Thank you. Thank you.